high hopes and rousing songs, Americans left for World War I. Reuben Plank, a husky, yanked him into town one day. I said, I can't resist. I really must enlist by hate. I'll help to get that Kaiser bill I hear so much about. He passed the test through all his chest and started in to shout. It's a long way to Berlin, but we'll get there. Plump of Sam will go the way. They found trenches, mud, and death. The very savagery of the war made the cry for peace more ardent. Following World War I, the ultimate weapon, the greatest war machine ever made, was the battleship. It was a symbol of a nation's war-making ability. The mighty dreadnoughts were being challenged on two fronts, by the American peace movement, which wanted disarmament, and by a brash army general named Billy Mitchell, who wanted to destroy them with the weapon of the future, the airplane. The First World War brought a whole new arsenal to the battlefields. By the time the fighting ended, most world leaders felt the ultimate weapon had been designed. The initial challenge of the 1920s to American foreign policy was to harness the awesome technological developments of World War I and curb the rising influence of Japan, which had emerged from the war as a major military power. An intense naval arms race followed World War I between Great Britain, the United States, and Japan. The United States launched an ambitious naval building program determined to have a Navy second to none. The military establishment had all the momentum and no one reflected on what it might mean. After the armistice in 1918, the Navy asked Congress for funds to triple its battle fleet. was talk of war in the Pacific with Japan. In a special report, the Navy argued that Japan aimed at commercial and political domination of the Far East. The report said the Japanese were aggressive and militaristic. President Harding's foreign policy of America first required naval supremacy. After the war, the Navy ordered its battle fleet to the Pacific. Japan countered the move and escalated its own naval building program. President Harding's policy seemed a direct threat to the Japanese. Professor Edwin Breischauer of Harvard. At this time, the great problem was that the United States was changing its whole concept of the world and was becoming to be the champion, you know, of self-determination and no more imperialism in one world and finally gets all into the Versailles Treaty and the League of Nations concepts and so on. And this went very much against the way the Japanese had gradually been getting their place in the world. They started late, just beginning to build an empire, a small island nation with a huge population, therefore very much dependent as they industrialized on a flow of raw materials into Japan, and of course exports from Japan, and yet only a little imperial base for it. And so here the Japanese faced the American concept of no more expansion, no more imperialism, with being cut out. It started too late. Others had gotten their great empires in the 19th century. Japan was still to get hers. And a great debate developed in Japan as to whether they were being hoodwinked by the West. The West was satiated already. 
it didn't want anymore, and therefore it could have the new rules, but Japan was as far from satiated and shouldn't therefore accept the rules of the West. So Japan viewed the American Navy as her principal threat. Sensing the threat of war, the American peace movement pressed for disarmament. Armistice Day, November 11, 1921, America buried her unknown soldier from World War I. President Harding compassionately called for an end to war. There goes on me the realization of the unusual character of this occasion. Our Republic has been at war before. It has asked and received the supreme sacrifices of its sons and daughters, and faith in America has been justified. But we never before sent so many to battle under the flag in a foreign land. Never before was there the impressive spectacle of thousands of dead returned to find eternal resting place in the beloved homeland. These dead know nothing of our ceremonies today. Every funeral, every memorial, every tribute is for the living, an offering in compensation of sorrow. One's words fail, his understanding of his emotions is stirred beyond control when contemplating these thousands of beloved dead. It must not be again. It must not be again. The great debate of the 1920s was between disarmament and collective security. Since America had rejected the League of Nations, collective security was now a dead issue. The new Republican administration believed arms limitation was a more practical approach to peace and called the world's first major disarmament conference. Three years after the armistice, the Washington Naval Disarmament Conference convened. Some old allies from World War I were there, France, England, and this time Japan. Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes headed the American delegation. Hughes was a shrewd diplomat who would dominate the conference. Senator William Bora originated the idea of a disarmament conference. Bora was not a delegate, but Henry Cabot Lodge of the Foreign Relations Committee was. Hughes was a practical man who believed in the art of achieving the possible. That meant dealing with the U.S. Senate. His credo was... Life is work, and then more work, and then more work. The Japanese delegation was headed by Admiral Baron Kato, a traditionalist who had to keep the young officers in line. During World War I, the Japanese seized everything that was German in that part of the world. That was one of the reasons they went into the war. And they took over the German position in Shandong, which was a very rich and important position in China. They took over the islands of the northern Pacific. And the European powers had agreed that they would get this after the war. Japan, however, could not afford more naval expansion. Already, one-third of the national budget was going to the Navy. French Prime Minister Briand worried about French security since France was no longer a major naval power. France's fall to second-rate status was even reflected in the seating arrangement. American Britain sat at the head of the table with France on the side. Briand, indignant, squeezed in at the top left corner. Lord Arthur Balfour, head of the British delegation, saw the American Navy as a threat. Initially, Britain saw the American Navy as a considerable threat. But in time, they came to conceive of the American Navy as a potential ally that could police the situation in the Pacific so that the British could concentrate their naval power on the Atlantic and the Mediterranean and in the Indian Ocean.
Battleship maneuvers raised the chilling specter of a naval war which, because of complicated treaties, might pit America against Britain and Japan. The conference would challenge the cleverest of diplomats. The Washington Naval Conference opened in this building, Continental Hall. It's now a library and a reading room. The galleries of the old marble hall were crowded with distinguished visitors and more than 400 journalists from around the world. The American Secretary of State, Charles Evans Hughes, gave the opening address. When he began to speak, the audience sat back and relaxed, expecting a standard ceremonial welcome. But Hughes stunned the audience with one of the most daring and ingenious diplomatic maneuvers in history. Competition in armaments must stop, he declared, and the only way to stop naval competition is to stop it now. And then, unexpectedly, he went into specifics. He proposed the scrapping of two-thirds of the American battleship fleet. He rattled off the names of the ships to be destroyed. In all, 30 capital ships would be scrapped, 15 old battleships and 15 under construction. But that wasn't all. He next proposed that Great Britain and Japan take similar action and went on to name British and Japanese ships to be destroyed. Once these ships were scrapped, there would be a naval building holiday for 10 years. The delegates were taken completely by surprise. An observer remarked, with one speech, Hughes sank more battleships than all the admirals in history. Hughes emerged in total control of the conference. The unflappable British were speechless. Lord Balfour could not allow 200 years of naval supremacy to go down the drain. The proud French had been reduced to a third-class naval power. Baron Cato of Japan wondered what motives lay behind the American proposal. As the delegates tried to calculate the damage, they issued vague, non-committal statements. France carefully objected to limits on submarines and the 10-year naval holiday. Lord Balfour said the British agree with the proposal in spirit and principle. Japanese also agreed in principle, but said they would add a few modifications. At the State Department, Hughes held secret meetings to iron out the problems. His goal was to finesse Japan out of its alliance with Britain. Hughes managed to break the old treaty. He also forced the Japanese to agree that for every five British and five American capital ships, the Japanese should have only three. In exchange, Hughes agreed not to fortify American bases in the Pacific. The Japanese did buy the concept that they, as a one ocean navy, were reasonably limited to a ratio of three to R5 and the British five, because we and the British were international two ocean navies and so on. And they did get the concession that we would not fortify ourselves between uh, west of Pearl Harbor on the part of the Americans or east of Singapore on the part of the British, which gave the Japanese naval domination to a very big segment of the world. Japan agreed to respect the territorial integrity of China and to submit disputes in the Far East to arbitration. While moderate Japanese leaders were pleased, young militarists in Japan felt betrayed. Although journalists hailed the treaty as a miracle, not everyone was happy. In Britain, one critic called it the bloodless surrender of the world's greatest empire. Following the naval conference, 70 ships were destroyed, scuttled, or shelled. $500 million saved was merely diverted to the unlimited construction allowed for cruisers, destroyers, and submarines. Surprisingly, the treaty did not mention aircraft at all. The military dismissed the airplane as a weapon of war. It was considered only a diversion, a new toy.
An outspoken World War I flyer, however, General Billy Mitchell, had become obsessed with the military potential of air power. He believed that bombers could destroy battleships and cities, that airplanes were the weapon of the future. During the summer of 1921, he set out to prove his theory. The Navy had fought Mitchell and opposed the tests. Newly elected President Harding, however, decided to give him a chance. The captured German battleship, Ostfriesland, would be the target. Hundreds of distinguished observers crowded the deck of the USS Henderson. To Mitchell, it seemed like the entire military establishment was there, hoping for his failure. Critics called Mitchell's mission an impossible, foolish gesture. Mitchell knew that if he failed to sink the Ostfriesland, his cause was lost. Mitchell said grimly, we had to kill, lay out, and bury this great ship. He had developed a new weapon to meet the challenge, a monstrous 2,000-pound bomb, the first of its kind ever made. In spite of his awesome weapon, the Navy gave him only a thousand-to-one chance of sinking the ship. On July 21st, Mitchell and his pilots took off to destroy the supposedly invincible battleship Ostfries Line. As he approached the majestic ship, Mitchell said, she looked like a grim old bulldog with the scars of Jutland still on her. Observers waited anxiously as Mitchell's pilots approached. Special guests that day included General Badoglio of Italy, who would later develop the Italian Air Force, and two observers from Japan named Kasuda and Shibuta. They kept four cameras busy during the bombings. Army Commander-in-Chief John Pershing, however fond he was personally of Mitchell, was not convinced that his air service chief was right. After the first round of bombing, damage assessment parties surveyed the Austries land. Though badly wounded, the Navy crowed, she was still afloat. cleared, the devastated ship, scarred almost beyond recognition, still refused to go down. Mitchell's supporters were distressed. The Japanese observers, however, were enthusiastic. In an interview with a newspaper reporter, they would say, very great experiment, profoundly exciting, our people will cheer your great Mitchell, and you may be sure will study his experiments. There is much here to learn. Mitchell had vowed to sink the ship. He was on the verge of losing his argument. He had only one more chance. demonstrations by Billy Mitchell is that the observers present, especially the Japanese observers, learned the lesson much more quickly than the Americans. The Japanese would apply the principle of air power quite specifically in their attack, both at Pearl Harbor and on Clark Field in the Philippines, in a way in which Mitchell had clearly demonstrated could be done, but that Americans had been slow to accept. It was the end of an era, the mighty dreadnought, the ultimate weapon, 
the symbol of empire and of war itself had been proved vulnerable. It would soon become a dinosaur. Only one person cried out for a substitute. We are no longer removed so far from attack that we can feel that distance gives us safety. Wars in the future will be determined in the air, not on the ground or on the water. And we must ensure our having an adequate and up-to-date Air Force in order to protect ourselves. Substitutes for the battleship were pitiful at first. They were flimsy, awkward, unwieldy. Only a handful of people like Billy Mitchell had any faith in them or could foresee their future. For 20 years, they remained the Navy's ungainly child to come into their own only during World War II. Washington Naval Conference, in a sense, paved the way for the aircraft carrier. The irony of the Washington Naval Conference was that it satisfied the peace movement without really accomplishing disarmament. While the treaty meant the dethroning of the battleship, it did not stop the arms race. Because the treaty limited the number of battleships we could build, naval strategists concentrated on building cruisers, submarines, destroyers, and aircraft carriers. In addition, they refined these weapons, adding greater firepower, cruising range, armament, and navigation equipment. Remember also the arms limitation agreement did not apply to land armies or to that weapon of the future which our military was slow to accept, the airplane. Nevertheless, the Washington Naval Conference achieved a certain amount of international stability for about 10 years. The post-World War I battleship race ended, and there was the illusion of disarmament. More important, disarmament pleased almost everybody, Idealists who were committed to pacifism, isolationists, and even realists who sought peace through a carefully calculated balance of power. But in reality, the arms race continued with more sophisticated and devastating weapons. In the meantime, Americans felt secure behind the God-given free security of two oceans. War seemed a distant threat. It was now time to relax and enjoy the 1920s. I'm sitting on top of the world. Just rolling along, just rolling along. And I'm sweating the blue of the world. 